Welcome back, everybody, to episode 29 of the Quantum Science Seminar, which today will be all about Rydberg atoms. As usual, we would like to get your questions, so please send us your questions via email to quantumscienceseminar at gmail.com or use the YouTube live chat at the right or at the bottom of the screen. If you'd like to join us for a discussion with our speaker today, after his talk, please use the Zoom link that I will post in the YouTube uh, chat at the end of the talk. Please also note that uh, there's a 30 second time delay between what we're doing here and what you see on YouTube. And with that, I'd like to hand over to Christian who will introduce our speaker today. Yeah, we are very happy uh, to have uh, Charles Adams speaking today in the Quantum Science Seminar. Charles uh, is a well-known expert in the field of quantum optics uh, with a strongly, at a strongly interacting um, meta light, uh, yeah, strongly interacting uh, uh, systems, um, basically realized uh, with uh, Rydberg atoms. That's what uh, will be his topic today. Um, let me give a, a short sketch of his bio. He studied physics uh, at Oxford University, got his PhD afterwards from uh, Strathclyde uh, in Glasgow. Then uh, he had a postdoc stay in Germany with Jürgen Mlynek and in the US with Stephen Chu working on laser cooling and trapping in the 90s. Uh, and then basically he started his own research group in Durham in October 1995. And back in that time, I think uh, if I got it right, he started also with uh, BCs and vortices uh, uh, and uh, solitons in BCs. And then in the mid 2000s, I think he changed focus to the strongly interacting Rydberg uh, gases. And he became, became basically one of the pioneers of these fields. And um, let me finish this intro with uh, listing uh, two prizes that he received. One is the Thompson Medal by the Institute of Physics in 2014. And this year, uh, the Holweg Prize, uh, which is a joint prize by the French and the British Physical Society. And now we are looking forward uh, to your talk, Charles. Charles, you are muted still. Thanks, thanks very much, uh, Christian, for that uh, kind introduction. It's really a great honor for me to give one of these series um, of talks, because I think it's a, a wonderful initiative that's come out of the, the crisis that uh, now we can be in some ways more connected um, around the world. So, so I just want to begin by showing you um, where I am. So this is a map of uh, England, a population map of England. So our lab in Durham University is here. This is the city of Durham. A picture of it, but but for most of the time I'm actually over here in this big uh, wilderness, um, which, as you can see by a local picture, is is not a bad place to be. Although the weather now has been really terrible for the last uh, few months, so um, we're looking forward to the spring and better times ahead. Um, so, uh, so for some reason my screen is frozen. So. Um, let me just uh, try and start again. Okay, that's better. Okay, right. So I um, I wanted to call my talk the rise and rise of Rydberg atoms because it's been an amazing success story. Um, people were working on. Rydberg atoms, you know, wait, wait, well, um, almost 100 years ago. And then there was a big activity with the invention of lasers in the 1970s. And then there was this kind of modern era of Rydberg physics that kind of began around 2000. So one of the seminal theoretical papers was uh, in, in uh, the year 2000, when they were proposed how to make, use the strong interactions between Rydberg atoms in order to make a quantum gate. So that initiated many people moving into the field and trying out some new ideas. And then the field really flourished in the 2000s and the 2010s. And it's, so by 2016, this is a Physics World article, which was called the rise of Rydberg physics and was talking about some of the interesting things going on. One of them is this strongly interacting photon idea, which was the area that uh, I'm gonna talk about today and we're still working on. Um, 
But the other interesting area, which I'm sure some of you know something about, is the uh, Rydberg quantum computers. And this has really been something that's coming up very fast now. And uh, I think it would also be right to claim that the Rydberg uh, quantum computing systems also have uh, demonstrated what you might call quantum advantage, similar to some of the other systems that we hear about. So soon you'll be able to buy these machines and uh, or, or at least run your programs remotely on these machines. So this is the one in, that's being built in Paris by Pascal. Um, there's an activity in the UK that's uh, led at Strathclyde by uh, John Pritchard. Um, that's a, picture, a recent picture of the group there with their lasers just delivered. Okay, so for me, when I became interested in Rydberg atoms, one of the things I found fascinating is that once you start looking at these diagrams, these energy level diagrams, you realize there are transitions throughout the electromagnetic uh, spectrum. So when you work with atoms, you're used to the idea of having these strong optical transitions between the ground state and first excited state. But when you sort of open your mind to other excited states, you realize there's transitions everywhere. So whatever region of the electromagnetic spectrum you would like to work in, you can find transitions in that region. So there's transitions in the terahertz region, there are transitions in the, in the microwave re region. And the, the aspect that I became really fascinated by was the ability that we have to couple all these regions together. So you can couple sort of microwave fields to optical fields or terahertz fields. Um, to optical fields, all using the structure of atoms. And that's basically going to be the main theme of my talk, um, is how you basically couple between these different regions or these different frequency domains. So very soon after we started looking at Rydberg atoms and we worked on this idea of Rydberg um, EIT, one of the very first things we wanted to do was say, what, what happens when we apply microwaves? And so this is a paper that's over 10 years ago, old now where we, we were looking at Rydberg atoms and we apply a microwave field. Um, and it was basically as soon as we could get hold of some microwave source, we started to do these experiments. And the funny thing for us at the time was that the interactions were so strong that we actually had to move our microwave source to the other side of the laboratory to stop it completely saturating the effect being too strong. So, so these interactions with microwave fields and Rydberg atoms was something that we had to learn of. They're enormous. Um, and that was something that we had to get used to. But of course, something that's big is generally uh, useful. And that's what, why Rydberg atoms are so useful because they have these enormous dipoles and these enormous interactions um, with, with each other and with fields. Okay, so the main theme of my talk is going to be about how we can couple these different fields together, and in particular, how we can map these strongly interacting or strong uh, microwave transitions and their properties down into the optical domain. Um, and when uh, Ofer Furstenberg invited me to give the talk, he said that you should just talk about something that's happening at the moment that you find interesting. And that gave me a dilemma because we have many Rydberg projects in Durham, and they're all fascinating and I thought it would be too difficult to try and cover them all. So I need to focus a little bit, but I'd like to just spend a few moments talking about some of the other projects just to give you an idea. But they all share this common theme where you couple optical to microwave or optical to terahertz. So the first project I'd like to mention is led by my colleague, uh, Matt Jones. And it's a solid state project. So it was a new activity for us in Durham. We've always worked um, with atoms and molecules, um, but now Matt has started this um, solid state project and it's based on this cuprous oxide crystal. Because in cuprous oxide, you can also excite Rydberg states. So these are exotonic Rydbergs. And this is part of a big collaboration also with Cardiff. So they bring the sort of solid state expertise. And what we've been doing as soon as we could see a Rydberg series, so this is a nice spectrum here that we've recorded showing um, these exotonic Rydberg series. So there's a P and a D and an S series. Um, and then we shine on microwaves and basically this spectrum changes. So these are very, very recent results. And what we find is that basically we can see the effect of the microwaves cou coupling to these Rydberg excitons. And if you want a practical device, it actually works as a very nice electro-optic modulator. So, so this is our light. And then when we apply the microwave field, we actually generate sidebands. And these sidebands are at plus and minus 20 gigahertz. Um, so, so it's a very 
uh, high frequency electro optic modulator. Um, and that's something that we're just beginning to explore, but we're hoping to take this in the quantum domain and start to think about doing quantum optics experiments using this solid state cuprous oxide Rydberg medium. So some of the things that I'll tell you about um, today using atoms, we're thinking about, can we also do those things in the solid state? Um, and then another project that's um, again, quite uh, uh, different and it's quite applied, but again, it mixes the same theme of, 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 of mixing different regions of the electromagnetic spectrum. So in this case, terahertz. So there are terahertz transitions between uh, states in the Rydberg series. And again, we can couple those to optical transitions. So in this case, we just drive a, a terahertz transition that then decays via the emission of optical photons. So, so where we have terahertz fields, we get bright fluorescence in our cell and we can actually use that to image the terahertz field. So this is a picture of a, of a psi that's imprinted into a terahertz field. Um, this is um, an, an actual movie of a, of a droplet. So, so usually um, water is very opaque to terahertz. So here you can see this. And, and it turns out that this detector is extremely sensitive. So this is the team working on our terahertz. It's led by my colleague, Kevin Weverell. Um, and just to give you an idea of where we are at the moment, this is a, a recent review of these of terahertz detectors. And that's where people were in terms of noise and uh, frame rate for making terahertz cameras. And then our device is way up here. So it's sort of, um, it's, it's orders of magnitude better. Uh, it's just appeared in PRX. Um, so it, again, it's something that we're extremely excited about. Um, and you might say the only problem with it was it wasn't really terahertz. So it was only 0.55 terahertz. And, and good for us is that we did enough that we earned some more money to buy a new source. And we know, so we now have a, a source that's above a terahertz. And this is the latest picture that uh, Lucy Downs has taken with our new source. And you can see now that the, the shorter wavelength of the higher frequency gives us much, much nicer resolution of the picture. So we're not limited by the atoms moving around. We're still limited by the, the wavelength of the terahertz. So again, this is something that I find very exciting um, and we're excited about the future of where this work is, is going. Um, but as I said, those are two. So those are the two projects that um, I think are very exciting and are very different. Um, but the, the, my main focus is going to be my sort of main area of activity, which is in the Rydberg quantum optics. So here the idea is that we can use these strong interactions between Rydberg atoms and map them into strong interactions between the, the optical photons. So there's lots of motivation for doing that. One of the things you might want to do is make a single photon source or you might want to make photonic gates, all optical photonic gates. You might want to build a quantum, an all optical quantum computer. You might want to build a quantum internet, a quantum internet or quantum repeater. So there are many, many groups working on related topics using Rydberg atoms in order to realize these type of things or, or just study the fundamentals of the physics involved. I just highlighted one paper here because I think it's it's from this year, it's from um, the group at uh, JQI, and they have the most impressive um, single photon source. So you here see a coincidence counts and, and basically they never, almost never get two photons in the same pulse. Um, so this really just shows the power of these uh, Rydberg systems in order to produce very, very nice, clean single photons. So I would just like to make a few points about why it's worth working with photons, because sometimes in a, if, if we, we're more in the sort of uh, atomic physics community, we tend to think of atoms, but um, photons are, well, the, the selling points is, it's easy to have many photons. So, so clear, usually we have too many. So when we have a laser source, we have many, many photons. So it's actually hard to get to the single photon regime. Photons are very robust, so even at room temperature, they're, they're very stable qubits, if you like. So we've seen some nice results on that recently and, and in, in other areas. And so that, and of course, they're ideal for any kind of communications or networking. So we can send photons very, very long distances um, without them decohering. So they have extremely nice coherent properties. So the, the sort of negative, so to speak, is that making photons interact is still a challenge. So we have 
There are many systems where this can be done, but in some ways it, it doesn't really work well in any system. And even in, well, even in the systems I'm gonna talk about, there are still challenges to overcome in order to achieve strong, strong photon photon interactions. So it's still a very, very active area of research. So this whole area of quantum nonlinear optics based on the Rydberg atoms is now a big field and that's gonna be my main focus. But there's another area that's slightly more applied, which is using um, Rydberg systems and light, optical light. And again, this idea of mapping between the microwave region and the optical region using something like Rydberg electromagnetically induced transparency to sense, as a sensor to sense um, microwave fields or as we saw before, terahertz fields. So this is also a, a kind of a, a, a big uh, flourishing research area that's slightly more applied. And there, there are also commercial companies now existing in, in this space. Um, so the stuff I'm going to talk to you about kind of bridges these two a little bit. So some, you can think of it as a bit as sort of sensing of microwave fields, or you can think of it as microwave control of uh, nonlinear optics. Um, so, so all our experiments tend to involve microwaves and light and single photons. So it's somehow bringing, synthesizing the, some of these different things together and looking at different uh, directions we can go with that. Okay, so our photon team that's working on our Rydberg quantum optics, this is our, our photon team. Um, so it's led by myself and together with my colleague, Kevin Wetterall, um, and we have various support. And this is the picture that I stole from the Physics of the World article that kind of sums it up as, as well as anything. Okay, so what's the basic uh, platform of what, of, of what we do? So the idea again goes back to a paper that dates um, from around the year uh, 2000 by Fleischauer and Lucan on, on what's called the dark state polariton using electromagnetically induced transparency. So, so in, in electromagnetically induced transparency or EIT, we have some system, we have some free level system and we have two lasers. So we have a probe laser and then we have a coupling laser. And usually this coupling laser is very intense. The probe laser could be uh, very weak, so it could even be single photons. And so this coupling laser couples these two states and it can create dark states. Um, it can also create the phenomenon of slow light and we can control the group velocity of light by controlling the intensity of this laser. So this is what we're trying to depict in this little video here, that if I send in a pulse on this probe transition, so that's a red pulse, and then I change the intensity of the coupling laser. This is this blue line here. So we decrease the intensity of the coupling laser. Then what happens is you gradually slow down this pulse. So the group velocity actually increases. And in principle, when you go to zero intensity on this uh, uh, coupling laser, it actually goes to infinity. So at that point, the, the light actually completely stops inside the medium and it will just stay there. So this is the idea of a photon memory or photon storage inside a medium. And then if we want to release that light again, what we do is just turn this coupling laser back on. And when we turn it back on, then the light is read out again. And, and what's nice about this is that everything about the phase is written into the medium. So we come in with some photon that has a well-defined mode with some phase pattern and that well-defined mode and phase pattern is written into the medium. And that's why it's called a polariton because it has, it has both wave and particle-like character. So, so particle in the fact that it's a, say a, sing, a single photon-like and wave-like because it's got this phase pattern written into the medium. So the, this is the essential building block of our experiment. It doesn't work perfectly because it turns out for this pro to, to take one, say, single photon and write it into the medium with 100%, you need a very, very optically thick medium and it's very hard to achieve that limit. But it actually doesn't matter that it doesn't work too well because um, um, you, you can basically always store a sufficient, because you have a lot of photons to start with, it's easy to get to capture one, say, from your big collection. And then that becomes the basis of the single photon source that when we read that one photon out, that's our single photon source. So what's different to this paper now is instead of using, um, storing this light in say another ground state level, then we store the light in a Rydberg level. 
And because it's in this Rydberg state, then it has all the characteristics of Rydberg state. So the strongly interacting character, also the sensitivity to electric fields, the sensitivity to microwave fields, all these things are now properties, become properties of this Rydberg polariton um, in this form of this stored photon. So we store a photon as a Rydberg polariton and then it acquires all the properties of this Rydberg state. So that's the basic building block of our experiment. Um, what does our actual, so for experimentalists, I thought I would just show one picture of uh, our experimental setup. This was built um, by a former PhD student, Hannes Buscher, who's um, since moved to uh, Odense in um, Denmark and is now moving again. Um, so our basic setup is laser cooling and trapping. So we have a, a region here where we collect rubidium atoms, cold rubidium atoms and form a cold 2D beam. So this is a, a 2D magneto-optical trap. It forms a beam of cold atoms, which we fire down here into a science chamber. And then our experiments happen in the middle here. So, so all our lasers for doing this EIT, this dark state, um, this Rydberg polariton um, protocol all propagate along this axis here. So actually the experiment is relatively simple. It's just uh, cold atoms um, and then a couple of lasers that excite up to a Rydberg state. And then we detect the light as it's transmitted through our, and, and do things like count photons. The one extra ingredient is we have an optical dipole trap in order to get slightly higher densities. So after we've done our laser cooling, we trap the atoms in a far off resonant optical dipole trap, which gives us a, an ensemble of atoms with a reasonably high density and optical depth. So let's look first at this effect of Rydberg interactions on the photon storage. So I've said that we can, we can do some protocol. So you'll see some diagrams that look a bit like this, which take some explaining. So basically this, this uh, curve here is the pulse, or my probe pulse that I send into my optical medium. And then in the background you see this blue dotted line, and this is the coupling laser that we said we had, which we turn off, and then at some later time we turn back on again. So that was just like the dark state polariton that I showed you in the movie. And then when the atoms are there, if we actually measure what happens, it's, we get a rather sort of complicated curve that has these various features. So at the beginning, there's a sort of initial transient as the atoms um, sort of adjust themselves to the fact that there is light coming along. And then the, the, the transmission changes as we, as we basically change. So there's some transparency and then the transparency is reduced as we reduce this coupling laser. So that's that sort of going up here. And then the pulse goes off. And then there's a little thing called the flash here, which is just some, some of the light is released immediately from the medium, which is the light that was left in the excited state or intermediate state in this three level system. And then when we turn the field back on, we see what we stored. So, so this bit here, which is blown up in the inset, is our stored light. So you can see here that it, the efficiency is quite poor, you know, that the amount that we store compared to the amount that we sent in is relatively low, but that's okay as long as we have something to work with. So, so we store enough. Um, so this is that now a plot then of how much um, we store. So how much is in this retrieve pulse relative to how much we sent in. And then we do that for different states in the Rydberg series. So starting out with an N equals 30 state, then you see that basically it's just that the two things are just linearly proportional. So. So there's basically no effect of the fact that when we store more photons in this, in this cloud, it doesn't really care. So there's no interactions between these stored photons. But now as we go up in the Rydberg series, we get stronger interactions between, these, uh, between the Rydberg atoms. So as you look here at N equals 48, you start to see a saturation of the amount of light we can store. And then if we go up to 80, you see this complete saturation of the amount of light you can store. And in fact, depending on the size of your cloud, then you saturate at exactly one photon. So if your cloud is smaller than what's called the blockade volume, then, I, then you can only store one photon because the second photon, because that first stored Rydberg will shift off resonance the transition to store a second photon. So, you, so that's how you realize this single photon source. 
Um, so here I've just shown our own measurements. So we do this uh, write sequence where we write our photons into polaritons. And then as I've just shown you, we can, if, if we have a small enough cloud that's within this blockade radius, then we can only store one photon. So if we measure the coincidences in, in the same shot, then we see this massive suppression. So this is um, uh, at the anti-bunching of the single photon sorts. And, and that's similar to the, the plot I showed you earlier from GQI, but they do an, a much better job than, than we do. So we suppress to some level and they do even better. But, but this is, so this just shows us that we can basically, if we want to, we can engineer a situation where we have exactly one photon stored in our ensemble. Maybe it's a good time just to see if there's any questions at this stage to see if people are following this okay. Um, so I'll, I'll just wait a little bit because what I'm going to do from now on is to talk about experiments we do with this um, basic build, building block and then starting to add the, the microwave fields. So just to see if there's anyone uh, wants to ask anything before we start getting more sophisticated with what we do with these stored photons. So for the moment, we have few, I mean, two questions, mainly, uh, that has come. So we have a first question from Bill Phillips that he asking that, so the high sensitivity of Rigber state is great, but does it present a problem in achieving the high fidelity one will need for quantum computation? Um, possibly, I, I think that it, so, so you have to try and select states that are well isolated from other Rydberg states. Um, so if you can, it's all about control. And so if you can control your sort of two level system and know what all your phase shifts are gonna be, then it's okay, but if, if you can't, but I, I think we're in a fairly good position for that. So currently the limits are really to do with the lasers and maybe the motion of the atoms. So the, the sort of phase noise that you might expect to see in any kind of quantum operation is really laser noise and positional uncertainty. So I'm not worried about the Rydberg properties as being the fundamental limit. Okay, so then we have a second question about what you explained just now about the AIT. So you are saying that you have a global uh, low efficiency at uh, the beginning, can you explain why? Yeah, so the, in this dark state, so basically what you're doing is you're taking a photon that might have a bandwidth of like a megahertz and it's many meters. So if you take a narrow band photon and you, you say, how long is that photon? It's actually many meters long. And then what we what would like to do is compress that photon from many meters down to sort of 10 microns. Um, so you're looking at, um, you know, sort of six orders of magnitude of compression. So you've got to sort of change this group velocity of your photon by six orders of magnitude. And, th and then you have, uh, so that's a very tricky thing to do really over it. So if you imagine solving the propagation equations and then compressing this photon very quickly. So it, so it turns out in order to do that, you need extremely high optical depth. And it's very hard to achieve the optical depths um, that you need. So basically you need densities that are extremely high. Um, so you need sort of BEC level densities or, or even higher than BEC level densities in, in, in order to do that. Now there are solutions to this, um, which we haven't pursued, but people are aware of them. So one of the solutions is that working with randomly distributed atoms is an extremely bad idea because it's very inefficient at coupling between light and matter. But if you work with ordered arrays, you can reduce the number of modes that interact between the, the, the excitation modes of the atoms and the light. So if, for example, you create a monolayer of atoms with a sub-wavelength spacing, you can get much, much stronger coupling. So I think in the future, what we would like to do to increase the efficiency is, is to work with much more structured arrays rather than disordered random ensembles. But, it, but it's tech, again, it's a technical challenge. So it's a, 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 at the moment, we're sort of limited by how many things we can do simultaneously. Okay. We, we have a question in the, in the chat asking how, what is the number of Rydberg atoms in the MOT? Um, so there's... So the, the number of atoms we get is limited by this blockade volume issue. So, so depending on how, how high you tune in, tune in the Rydberg series, 
So, so if you imagine that basically if I create one Rydberg atom in, an, in let's say, an N equals 80 um, state, then the next nearest one might be 10 microns away. So if my sample is only got a dimension of 10 microns and I only get one Rydberg atom, but if my, if my sample has a dimension of 50, let's say it's a, it's a line that's 50 microns long, then I can store five Rydberg atoms or five Rydberg excitations. So it's a question of geometry and what Rydberg state, how many Rydberg atoms you get. Okay, so the, the very last question for now, that is from the beginning, so about the cuprates, uh, what limits the maximum visible state in the cuprate spectroscopy? So here I think it was 12D. Yeah, so at the moment, so um, there's been some other work. So the pioneering work was done in Germany, in Dortmund, and they have a natural crystal which has lower impurities. And they've seen up to N equals 25 in the Rydberg series. And it seems that a lot of the limitation is that you create almost like a plasma in the medium. So you create a lot of free electrons that are then perturbing the Rydberg states and they broaden them so much that you can't resolve them. So, so the goal is to try and work out how to create very pure homogeneous um, cuprate crystals. So crystals of this cuprous oxide. That, that don't have these uh, bad effects going on. So that's obviously much harder in solid state materials, but it, it's essentially copying what people learn to do in say silicon, where they learn to create extremely pure samples of uh, silicon. So if we can learn how to do that, then maybe we can see even much higher Rydberg states in the series. Okay, thank you. I think that we can continue with the talk. Thank you, Charles. Okay, great. Thanks for the nice questions, everyone. Okay, so, so I've talked a little bit about storing uh, photons in one of these channels. Um, so we, we have, say, one of these traps, an ensemble of atoms, and then we store a photon, and we store it in this, this Rydberg polariton. And, and we've done some experiments where we do two channels. So this is, um, so just a, a few years ago, we had a paper on where we looked at two channels, and this shows our two channels and the storage going on in the two channels. And they were completely independent, so they were separated by about uh, 10 microns so we can address them individually. So, so it starts to look a little bit like some of the um, atom, Rydberg atom quantum computing experiments where you can have this single site addressing of many channels. And now we can have interactions between the photons in this channel and that channel. So, so as soon as you, I can do experiments on one channel, I say I can do experiments on two channels. And then we know um, from work that's been reported uh, recently that it's now then a simple step to go to many channels. Well, it's an engineering goal. So, so there's this beautiful experiment recently reported um, from, from the group in uh, China where they have 100 channels and 100 of these single photon counters. So, so if you're an experimentalist, you immediately start adding up how much money you need to buy a single uh, 100 single photon counters, so, um, which is quite a lot. Um, but we're not quite going there yet. And in fact, you'll see in the talk that we're very much concentrating on just one channel at the moment, because there's quite a lot for us to learn about the Rydbergs and the light matter interface based on a single channel. But, but I'm just suggesting that once we can do one or two channels, we can start to think about more than where we would go with that. Okay, so the, the big question that we've been asking from for quite some years now, in fact, we first proposed it about six years ago, theoretically at least, um, but we're still looking at it and we still haven't really achieved it experimentally, is could we use the microwave fields to control the interactions? So, so we know that Rydberg atoms are strongly interacting. We know they strongly interact with um, microwave fields. And we know we can map these strong interactions into strong interactions between photons. So can I now use the microwave field to control the photon-photon interactions via the Rydberg states? So that's something that we would like to do. So the sort of scenario is something like this, that we might say write one photon as an excitation in one Rydberg state and another photon as a Rydberg, as a Rydberg excitation in another Rydberg state. So we'll call these two Rydberg states R and R dashed. And then I use a, a microwave field to couple this R excitation, so one Rydberg state to another state that's then quite close in energy to this one. So these two have a much stronger interaction. Um, the, this, Greek, this state here has a stronger interaction with R dashed than the original R state. So this way I could take two states. So let's say I write two polaritons and they're non-interacting. 
And then I drive this microwave field to make them strongly interacting. So if you like, uh, initially I would have some uh, range of my interaction, which here we call this RB6. Um, but then when I apply the microwave field, suddenly the range of that interaction gets much longer and it becomes this RB3. So that way I can basically write photons into my medium and then induce interactions and control those interactions with microwave fields. And that would have a very nice, um, it would be very nice because the microwaves are very easy to control. And as you'll see, we can, we can do, do various operations with them and we can do them very, very fast because of these uh, very big uh, strong coupling to the Rydberg states. And if we could do that, we could also, we could either write our, our photons into adjacent channels, or we could even write them into the same location in the medium, but just use different spatial modes. So, so you can imagine how this system would become very nicely scalable. And I can actually envisage rather sort of complicated multi-channel uh, operations where I then apply a series of microwave pulses in order to, to do some kind of um, processing or control or quantum algorithm. So that's the kind of, sort of vision and direction we're working in. So let's talk a little bit about what we've done in terms of the microwave control and what we've learned so far. So, so the idea is then that we have this uh, EIT scenario and then we write a photon, which is written as a, as a Rydberg polariton. And here I've written down um, an equation for the polariton wave function. So as I mentioned, it has both this phase property where we're writing the phase of the photon here and it has this single Rydberg excitation um, that, that's in one of the uh, atoms here. In the, so there are n atoms, and one of them is excited to the Rydberg state, but we don't know which one. So, so, we, so it, this excitation is shared amongst all atoms, and we don't know which is the excited atom. So we have to write it as a superposition of any one of them being excited. And then I'm going to call this state zero, because that's what quantum computing people do. And now we're going to apply a microwave field to another Rydberg state. So what that does is it takes this uh, it takes this excitation r and excites it to r dashed. So whichever term in this superposition is the Rydberg state will now get driven to this state r dashed. Um, so here it looks simple in terms of a single atom, but it's actually happening in this uh, collective basis where it's all, all of the terms in the superposition get, getting driven to this other state. And then we'll call this state our state one. So you can think of this as a collectively encoded qubit where my zero and ones are my qubit states, but now this, cube, this excitation as the qubit is shared amongst n atoms. Now there's some, it, this qubit has some nice properties. So um, one of the nice features um, is that the Rabi frequency to drive this transition doesn't depend on the number of atoms. So because of this one over square root of n and the n terms appears in both terms, um, it doesn't matter how many atoms I've got. So if I run my experiment again and I get 10 more atoms then the Rabi frequency doesn't change. So, so that gets us around one of the problems of collective encoding. In general, any kind of collective superposition state depends on the number of terms you have. but, but these two have the same number, so, so the independence cancels out. The other thing is, and I'll show you in a minute, is we can do this really, really fast. So because this dipole moment to drive this R to R dash transition is extremely large, because the Rydberg atoms are, are extremely large, then we can drive this really, really fast. So in, in, the, in a few nanoseconds, if we want to. The other nice feature of this is this excitation now, when we couple it back to this excited state, then it, then it gets read out as a photon. And, and we know the mode of that photon because this thing has got this phase pattern. When we de-excite this polariton, then it reads out as a photon and the phase pattern is written into that phase pattern. So we know exactly that. So there's a very, very nice coupling between this collectively encoded qubit and a single and the single photon emitter that we sort of hinted at uh, before. Um, and then another nice feature you might say is that uh, now, so mostly when we do qubits, um, and this is a problem for atoms in particular, is that we, we write the qubit into one atom and if we lose the atom because uh, something collides with it or something else bad happens, then we've lost everything. But here we can afford, because we have the, the uh, quantum information encoded amongst uh, n atoms, if we lose one atom or we lose a few atoms, we only lose a fraction 
of the quantum information and not all of it in one shot. So, so it's quite a robust, um, and that's what I mentioned in the abstract of the talk. So we just wrote a paper about these collectively encoded uh, qubits that's on, on the archive. Um, we, and we were also testing how robust they are against electric field noise and uh, scattering of light and, and, and various things like that. So, so I think it has some nice features. I'm not claiming it's definitely the best way. I'm certainly not claiming it's the best way to do a quantum computing, but it's an alternative to the single atom encoding of quantum information. Okay, so, so given that we've got this collective encoding scheme now, let's look at some of these features. So I mentioned one of the nice features is that we can read, read this out in the form of single photons. So if, if, if I'm driving this collectively encoded qubit here with my microwave field, and then I also apply this coupling laser, then some of this Rydberg state here is driven to this excited state. And this excited state is the one that decays fast back to the ground state with the emission of, a, of this single photon. And this is our optical photon that, that we can then detect and count on our single photon counter. So the sequence in our experiment is relatively simple. It's the same one that I showed you before for writing the Rydberg polaritons that I send in a pulse of this uh, red light, which uh, excites to this intermediate excited state here. And then I apply this coupling laser that excites to the Rydberg state, R. And now the extra addition is we're going to add a microwave field that couples this R to an R dash state. And the sequence is just, so we, we turn on this pulse for a while, and then we're just gonna leave on this coupling field and also leave on this microwave field and look at what happens. So, so while this microwave field is on, we can drive Rabi oscillations on this zero to one transition here. But, but the whole time we're sort of dribbling out or leaking out population back to this E and it's getting, it's, some of it is coming out as an optical photon. So we're gonna see, uh, data that looks a little bit like this trace here. Um, so I'll show you this in the uh, real case. Now, one thing I want to point out here, and it relates back to, I think it was Bill Phillips's question about um, what, what, what are the sort of bad things that can happen with Rydberg atoms. And one of the bad things is that um, we, there are many, many Rydberg states. So um, it's actually much more complicated and usually people don't tell you about this. So, so we, this is an experiment where let's say we couple to this n equals 80 s state, and then, and then it just shows some of the nearby p and d states. And you see that there are really loads of them. And then if I drive a microwave field from 80 s to 79 p, this is at 7.6 gigahertz, but there are actually other transitions that are very, very close. So just detuned by um, only 640 megahertz is a transition up to 80 p here. So so if, if I try to drive this very fast, so let's say I try to drive it at a gigahertz, then I'll also couple to this state because, because within the detuning, um, um, the, well, within a gigahertz, I'm also gonna be resonant um, with this transition. So, so that's kind of one of, that's actually the limit of how fast we can go. So in principle, we have enough microwave power that I can drive this transition at gigahertz. But if I do that, I start driving population to other states. So that's our kind of speed limit. Um, but still it's a very, it's a pretty fast uh, Rabi oscillation if you're going, you know, 10 megahertz is, so we can't, we can't go at um, four gigahertz or something, but we can go fairly fast. Okay, so here's an example of an experiment that we might do. Um, so we write, we apply our microwave fields and then we read out. Um, and, in this particular case, we, we do something with the microwaves. So we apply the microwaves for some time. So we transfer some population and then we read out what's in the zero state um, by um, applying um, this coupling laser and seeing how many photons we get. And then we apply the microwave again to drive that back. And then we can read out what's in the one state. So you see now that we've driven some of the population from zero to one and we read out the zero. And then when we turn the microwave back on, we can read out the one. Um, but now let's look at this other sequence that I showed you where we leave everything on continuously, which is a little bit more complicated. So let me try to explain what's going on here. So firstly, as I explained that if, 
So this is after the, so just after this time here. Uh, just after the red pulse goes off. Then we, we look at um, what happens to the amount of photons we detect. And if we don't have the microwaves on, so this is this uh, trace here, we just see an exponential decay. So what's happening is that population is, is draining out of our Rydberg state because we've got this coupling laser on. So essentially we, de we control the decay rate with the Rabi frequency of this coupling laser. So it, it's like a leaky, it's like a leak out of the Rydberg state. And now when we apply this microwave pulse, we can drive these Rabi oscillations between this zero and one state. And so you see now these fast Rabi oscillations happening. Uh, but you also see firstly that the population decays initially much more quickly, but then it, then it stops decaying, so or almost stops. So, so you see this initially faster decay and then something that's much more slow. And then when we stop the microwave, we see a big bump um, at the end here. Um, so what's going on here? Well, we're actually driving, so what, what this microwave dressing field is, it's actually creating a symmetric and an anti-symmetric superposition of this zero and one state. And one couples strongly to our readout and one couples very weakly. So we have, if you like, a bright state and a dark state. Um, so the bright state reads out very quick, and then we've only got the dark state left. So when we're over here, we're basically in this anti-symmetric superposition of zero and one, and this can live a very long time. Um, so it's protected against decay. And if we measure the populations in these bright and dark states, as we drive much str stronger and stronger into the Rydberg series, so this is increasing the uh, microwave field on the Rydberg transition, um, then you see that they equilibrate at about 50%. So we get about 50% of the population in the dark state and 50% in the bright state. So, so, it's an, an, so I think this is interesting because I'm doing kind of continuously monitoring of this qubit driving and, and I can also build population or, or if, you, if I want, I can, I can post select on this dark state of the, of the um, put it into this, um, zero plus one or zero, uh, uh, zero minus one basis, depending on how long I drive the system for. This is just using the same thing now, but looking at that long time dark state and then looking at how long it survives for. And I just wanted to show this to show that we can drive. So we've gone up to about 70 megahertz Rabi oscillations. And as I mentioned, eventually we would be limited by this populating other states. Um, but you can see how these oscillations persist for a very, very long time, hundreds and hundreds of nanoseconds, and we can see many, many Rabi oscillations. So I think it's a nice feature that we can continuously watch our, our qubit, our collectively encoded qubit, uh, Rabi oscillating. Okay, so I now want to talk about some more, um, I think I'm getting close to the, so maybe I'll um, go fairly quickly um, through so, so we, we've done a sequence of experiments and maybe I'll go on to um, what I think maybe is the most interesting one, which is this, um, let me talk about this one here. So, so I've talked a bit about um, driving with one microwave field and now we can add more microwave fields. So as I showed you, there are many, many states in, in these Rydberg series and I can couple to any one of them but just adding another microwave with another frequency. So we now add a second microwave field. And what that does is we talked about this state being a zero, this state being a one. So if I couple to another state, this would become a two. So I now have a collectively encoded single photon Q-trit that I can now do dynamics of this uh, Q-trit. So I just wanna show you some of the things we've been doing with that. So for example, let's say I want to prepare a good, a, a given uh, Q-trit state. So I want to prepare the state uh, one over root two zero, plus one over root two, one plus two. So that's basically 50% in zero, 25% in one and 25% in two. And we can do that by applying initial pi over two pulse on this first transition and then another pi over two pulse uh, on, the, on the second transition here. And then in order to read that, again, we're going to sort of map between the state space and time bin encoding. So, so I just then apply a sequence of pi pulses to read out each of these three Rydberg states in time. And what we see is this. So, um, 
So what you see here basically is this is my first state, the population in my first state before I've applied these pi pulses. Then when I apply this pi pulse, I read out the second, second state, which is this yellow one here. And I got 25% in that. And then I apply another pi. Uh, well, I have to apply a pi on this one and a pi on that one to read out this two state. And, and I find that I got 25% on in this one. So, so I think this protocol shows that we can prepare single photon Q-trits collectively encoded, and then we can read them out. So you can start to think about, okay, so what can I do with Q-trits? Are they useful? Um, and so there's some motivation thinking that maybe, um, why are we sticking with binary with quantum computing? Um, it's not necessarily the natural thing to do. So some of the things we've been studying with this sort of two, two microwave fields are just to see if we can do um, more complicated operations. And this is just comparing our experiment with some theory when we apply this pulse um, sequence and then we vary the Rabi frequency. Uh, this is our data. And then basically you solve these Gelman matrices for, for, the, for the SU3 and see if you can get out what you expect. And it, it, at the moment, we seem to have reasonable control of these, Q, of these single photon q -trits. So this looks a promising direction. So I'm nearly at the end here. I just, um, in terms of sort of outlook, I've mentioned going from um, collectively encoded qubits in the Rydberg manifold and then collectively encoded q -trits in the manifold. And this gets us more in this direction of synthetic dimensions where basically every state becomes a dimension in your system. And that's a, a thing that um, also my colleague, Simon Cornish in Durham is interested in, in, in doing molecules, which was proposed um, in this paper here. So you use the ladder of states as, as, um, as synthetic dimensions. And also another sort of connection that I think is very interesting is also in the superconducting qubit community, where, which I think have been extremely successful um, but they're also looking at uh, new directions and collective encoding and things like bosonic encoding. And uh, this is a very interesting proposal by Steve Gervin, which is something we also want to consider where, where now the, the quantum information lives not in the matter qubits, but in the photonic modes. Um, and I think our system is interesting for that because we can write many photonic modes into our ensemble and read them out at particular times and then do various sorts of processing on them. Okay, so I'm pretty much at the end now. I'm going to sort of just summarize what I've told you. So our basic platform then are these Rydberg polaritons that we, we store photons as Rydberg polaritons. Then they become strongly interacting. We can drive these polaritons to different Rydberg states using microwave fields. Um, and there are various protocols we can drive and read simultaneously and read them out as a, a single photons, or we can, we can do more complicated things like create Q-trits. Um, our, our outlook is to now look at how these, um, how these photonic collectively encoded qubits interact with one another, also how these Q-trits interact with one another. Um, and uh, we can uh, hopefully, maybe some people will be inspired to come up with some good ideas and tell me what I should be doing in the next uh, few years. So, so on that note, I'd like to thank everybody for listening and thanks for this opportunity of being able to talk to you. Thanks. So thank you, Charles. We have uh, some questions. So we have other questions from Bill Phillips. So he's asking uh, about uh, microwave control, saying that uh, he, the microwave control has the advantage and the disadvantage that the microwaves talks to all the atoms in a sample. Would it be useful to use an MRI-like gradient field technique to control where in space one addresses the atoms? Yeah, that, that would be one option. The, the other option for us is just to, to write the different sites um, into different Rydberg states. So I mean, the, the disadvantage of that is we need kind of, either we need a lot of lasers, um, we need a lot of lasers to initiate the system with every site being in a different Rydberg state. So I think gradients is one way to go, um, but it, it's also tricky because then you get, um, you get gradients. So it was something like this where you've written something in, um, that's got some spatial extent if I apply gradient fields, then I also end up with gradients across. But so because my stored photon has some spatial extent, 
then applying gradient fields will also um, introduce gradients across the photon mode. So, so just as an example, if I, if I do apply an electric field gradient to this state here, I actually end up deflecting the photon. So when I read out the photon, it comes out in a different direction. Um, so that could be useful or it may be bad, um, depending on how we do it. So then we have a second question. Uh, in the continuous monitoring experiment, it seems that this will be a good scenario for a quantum Zeno effect. Why isn't it? <laughs> um, we, we were thinking a lot about um, continuous measurement um, and quantum zeno. It, it, yeah, I, we ha I have thought a bit about quantum zeno, but I haven't thought about what I can do useful with it. I mean, one of the problems for us is that there's only one quanta of energy in our system. So that, that was the thing that was sort of puzzling us in a way that um, often, if you want to do something like a continuous measurement protocol, you sort of entangle your single quanta with something else that then you can measure as well. And our system's not like that. There is only one quanta and when we've measured it, it's all over. So I don't know whether there's, um, we're missing something. So we need to entangle with something else that becomes our meter in order to make a useful measurement. Okay. Then a the question about your uh, photonic Q-treats, or let's say in a general way of uh, Q-treats. Can, can you go beyond the, the Q-treats? Uh, how, how far you can go, especially in your actual experiment? Yeah, yeah. well, I think well, in principle, we can go very far. We just need more microwave sources. So, um, so, the, so at the moment, we've only got two microwave sources. So that's our limit. But um, in principle, it's not hard to add more. The, the other slightly, so our microwaves, they need to switch quite fast because all these pulses are done in sort of 10 nanoseconds. So, so it's just a, a question of cost. So if, if, if someone would like to supply us with another, um, another eight, let's say, microwave sources, then we could do uh, QDITs next month. Um, Okay, so then we have uh, another question, uh, uh, again from, uh, from Bill Felix. So concerning the idea of using different photonic modes to store different bits of quantum information, is this essentially an holographic storage scenario? What is the limit to how many different qubits can be stored? It is a large number of atoms. Uh, I think that the limit is more based on the optics. So, um, so that you sort of in a deep, so you somehow need to make these modes distinguishable at, at the end of the day. So it, it sort of becomes an optics, a diffraction problem. So you need modes that you can then become distinct in the far field. Um, so I think that, that, that you've got you've got the whole sort of three dimensionality aspect of this. So you could imagine storing around in, in rings. And, and so I could certainly imagine in one cloud, you could, you could write sort of 10 or 20 um, spatial modes give, given our sort of current setup. Um, yeah. Okay. So th then the very last question that ask uh, to, to specify uh, again, how you uh, go back from the, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the level of the, how, I mean, the, the mapping from the photonics and the atomic state. Uh, so if you can distinguish uh, on the photon that you can get back, uh, uh, fr uh, I mean, uh, which uh, is the uh, Rydberg state. Yeah, so we do that with the time. So maybe it's, if I just go back to this uh, picture here. So, so basically it's all done with the microwaves and the timing sequence. So we, um, Basically, if we've got some superposition of say this state, so what we call zero, one and two, and then I just turn on the light, I only couple to zero. So first I read out zero. So that's what happens when we just, so when this blue comes back on, we just read out zero. So then, I, then that's what we measure here. And then I apply a microwave, which couples any population that's in this one state back to zero and now the blue's still on, so immediately when it gets back to zero, it gets read out as well. And similarly, then I apply a pulse that drives anything in two back to one and then back to zero. And so as soon as it's back in zero, it gets read out. So using this sort of time sequence of microwave pulses, I can very easily map between Rydberg state 
and, um, and, and the optical photon. So it's basically going from sort of state encoding to time bin encoding of your photons. Okay, Th thank you very much uh, for the very nice talk and the answering to the question. And I think it's time to, to go back to Sebastian. Yeah, thank you also from my side, Charles. It's a really cool and interesting talk. I would like to take this opportunity to announce our second Young Researcher session that will take place on January 28th. Please have a look at the nomination page on our website for more information on how to apply. The deadline is January 6th, so I know it's tight, but you know, you guys can do it. Next week on December 17th, we will have uh, Dima Butger speaking about a new proposal to create uh, use the LHC in a very different way. He would like to use it as a novel light source and as a giant iron trap, so stay tuned for that. If you want to get notified for what we're doing, please go to our website, uh, quantumscienceseminar.com, subscribe to our email list and our Google calendar. You can follow us on Twitter. You should also check out our sister seminar where tomorrow they will have Rob Schulkopf giving yet another talk, but on a different topic than he was talking about last week here, namely on quantum error correction. If you want to join us for a Q&A session with Charles, please dial in with the Zoom link that I'm going to put into the YouTube chat window. With that, thank you for your interest and we hope to see you again next week. Same time, same place. Bye. Bye.